Welcome to the Tamiki Ergonomics Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Jeffs. Today's guest is an emeritus professor in the Department of Human-Centered Design at Cornell University. There, his research and teaching activities focused on design and workplace ergonomics as they affect health, comfort, and productivity of workers. He has edited and co-authored books on ergonomic workplace design, advances in ergonomics modeling and usability, as well as the Handbook of Human Factors and Ergonomics Methods. That weren't enough. He's published 41 book chapters, 82 peer-reviewed journal articles, 170 refereed proceeding articles, 43 conference, conference proceedings, 15 technical reports, 13 legislative reports, and 159 conference presentations on ergonomics and related topics. He's a fellow of three societies, one being the er Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, where he's won numerous awards. But he's also a member of the Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors and the International Ergonomics Association. Since 2012, he has served as the program chair for the National Ergonomics Conference and Exposition. He is extensively cited in the national and international media and has appeared on numerous TV and radio programs. It's my pleasure to introduce to the Tamiki Ergonomics Podcast, Dr. Alan Hedge. Dr. Hedge, welcome. May I call you Alan? Of course you may. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Please call me Matt, and uh, we'll get our formalities out of the way. Uh, it's so good to have you here on the Tamiki Podcast, and uh, there's a lot I'd like to cover. I, I don't think we'll get it all on this time, but um, uh, I did an intro where we talked a little bit about your credentials so we could get right into content uh, with our time together. Um, and one of the things that I found fascinating in our talks previously uh, is you're a, a bit of a historian on ergonomics. And let me explain. I had thought the ergonomics field really started uh, back in World War II, and you brought to mind uh, some early ergonomics it, way back in the 19th century. Could you share with us a little bit of that, uh, that history, and then we'll get into more present times? Sure. In fact, if you look at the real history of ergonomics in its totality, um, we're on about the 200th anniversary of that. What we didn't talk about <laughs> previously, but um, is what was going on back then. If you go back about 200 years, astronomy was really a big deal for people. And there's a German astronomer called Bessel who noticed that some of his individuals who were timing the transits of planets came up with different numbers, right? And he's going, how can that be? Right? How can, if people are measuring how quickly a planet sort of is seen to cross the, the hairs of a telescope, how could you come up with different numbers? In fact, some of his colleagues even fired some of their observers. And eventually what people realized in the 1800s was human beings are enormously different in their capabilities. Some people have fast, what came to be known as reaction times, others have slow reaction times. And why is that relevant? Because then people realized that Reaction times are fundamental to the development of skills. And if you think about us as human beings, the goal of a human being is to become as skilled as you can in whatever you want to do. And if you look at that acquisition of skill, that's when people started to think about, okay, what are people doing in terms of work using skills? Because if I can employ somebody who's very skilled, <laughs> They can do the job faster, i.e. less expensively, than somebody who's an, a, a beginner. And so um, going back just over 100 years, that's when people really began looking at this whole concept of working life and what is work and what kind of behavior supports that work. And that, that, that led to two developments that are still fundamental today. Um, one was associated with a technology development, and ergonomics has been influenced by a couple of those in its short lifetime. Uh, the first one it was influenced by was the development of 
telegraphy, wireless tele or, or wired telegraphy originally. Okay. And that meant people learning a new language called Morse code. And the second was the development of the typewriter, um, the original typing machine. And that, of course, led to modern day keyboards and uh, in, was a huge part of the computer revolution that really began in the, in the 70s. So those two things really, in terms of technology changes, helped to propel uh, modern ergonomics forwards. But learning Morse code was related back to looking at levels of skill. And how do people become skilled? How do they learn a job? Now, if I can show you an illustration, I took this from the, hopefully this will, I don't even see this. I you can see, see it. You can see yes. two curves. Well, this yes. is from a paper written in 1897, right? No kidding. So, um, you know, over 100 years ago. And what the researchers were looking at here was how do people learn to operate um, Morse code when what all you have is, you know, a little Morse code uh, sort of uh, uh, lever that you're pressing up and down. And what you see here in the, the top line and the bottom lines are the different lines over time. This is over nearly a 40-week period. Um, this is what would be considered a slow operator. And you can see people start off, they're not very good at either sending or receiving Morse code messages. And it's not linear, right? So as you and you can also see there are a few little dropbacks where as the skull gets better, it gets worse temporarily. Yes. So if you think about it, every job that somebody does is like that. Now, why is that relevant to what we're talking about? Well, I'm not going to get into performance, but I'm going to get into the risk of injury. Because invariably, the more skilled you are, the less risk you have of getting injured. Um, because there are techniques for doing that work. <laughs> uh, and those techniques have to be learned and they have to be successfully taught. Um, and ergonomics has played a huge role in that. So if you think of all the technology developments from flying planes, driving cars, using computers, whatever, fundamentally what underpins that is the ergonomics work that has been done to look at how do you get people to develop skills in the quickest way so their performance is as fast as possible, as accurate as possible, with minimal risk of injury. So that was one source for ergonomics. And maybe in a later podcast, we can get into a little more detail on that, because this applies not just to manual skills or physical skills, but also mental skills. And of course, it's fundamental to what most people watch, that is athletics, right? <laughs> How right. do you become a star tennis player, a star football? Right. So you can think about life. I mean, if you go back to Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest, you can really say it's survival of the most skilled. Right? Yes. <laughs> because the, the most skilled animal is the one that can find food best, can catch food best, can eat food best, can escape best. <laughs> So all of human behavior really is about becoming more skilled, either intellectually, verbally, athletically, whatever it is. Now, of course, you, you don't necessarily, you could become very skilled at something that you may say doesn't really have any environmental consequence in terms of our society, which brings us to your earlier point. Where did ergonomics come from? Well, it so happens that I have here uh, of course, it's back to front <laughs> on here. And so all the lettering is back to front. Uh, and I don't know if I'm able to reverse my camera, but probably not. But these are the original four papers written by a Polish professor. Excuse my poor Polish pronunciation. Wojciech Jaszczybowski. And I want to just read you two quick extracts from Please. this. Very, very simple extracts. The first is, what is work? And he says, work is the mother of all good. You've got to remember that slothfulness <laughs> is one of the deadly sins. So he's saying here, well, work is really important to people. And if people 
are good at doing work, they're not likely to become what he calls bad men. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting take on it. Yes. But let's go to the second part of this, which is what earth is work. Here he divides, or you can't see it, work into two types of work. There's useful work, okay, which is right. typically what you want to do. And then um, he talks about work that is not useful. In fact, work that um, can actually cause problems. He calls it harmful work. Hmm. And you can think of harmful work as people making mistakes, people um, uh, breaking things at work, right. people getting injured at work. And he he's the guy who said, we should use this Greek or, or, or a word derived from Greek, ergon meaning work, nomos meaning principles or laws, and call this discipline ergonomics. Wow. And this was in 1857. 57. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, so there's a, a long history to thinking about things. And we can talk about why it took nearly 100 years before ergonomics became officially recognized as a professional discipline. Um, but I won't take up too much time. No, no. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting because uh, you, you describe or uh, this Polish author describes, which I'm also a little hesitant to try and uh, uh, describe uh, pronunciate that last name <laughs> yeah. but but uh it almost it's almost as if he's describing an ergonomics philosophy there's a philosophy around it and absolutely yeah it, it is i mean the papers really are sort of philosophical papers because yes. what he, but it's based on if you like it's based on some theological ideas that work is good for you yes right? that it's sinful not to yes. be working or to be doing bad things. And he talks about, you know, the problems of being too idle, of not doing work. But yeah. when you think about it, I mean, take away the theological aspect of it, work today is fundamental to how we structure our societies. Precisely. And uh, I think yeah. everyone strives for meaningful work. It, it, I, I would assume, I, I, I could be wrong, but it seems like we, we'd like to feel like we're having some positive impact on the world, one would think. Uh, one would think, but there are people who just want to earn the biggest buck they can for whatever they do. There True. are people who want to get the most money for doing the least work. True. <laughs> um, if you think of the drug cartels, I'm sure that they work really hard, but they're not doing, they're doing what Yastrzebowski would say is harmful work, not uh, that could, useful that's work. Right. Precisely. So, um, but when you think of everything, you know, if you talk to a youngster, uh, one of the things you're likely to ask them is, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And work structures our society so that you you go through our education system so that you can enter the world of work. And then at the end of a certain period of time, you can exit that world of work and become retired. And of course, if you're in France, you can currently riot about the fact that <laughs> they're wanting to add two more years of work to your life. So not right. everybody loves their work. Some people That's do it good. out of necessity. But what Yastrzebowski is saying is if you really can love your work, then it's really not like work. It's yes. life for you. Yes, yes. That I had no idea it would have philosophical underpinnings. And you describe also... Uh, other uh, events in still, we're still in the 19th century here. Uh, for instance, the Hunley submarine. Mm -hmm. You taught me a little bit about the Hunley. Could you share its implications in ergonomics with our? <laughs> well, sure. So uh, uh, without going into too much detail, the Hunley was the first submarine. It was a man-powered submarine. It had a crew of eight people. And they had it didn't have an engine. They were the engine. <laughs> uh, they couldn't row it like you would row a rowboat. So they had to actually turn a crank that turned a propeller shaft and, and pushed the Hunley. The Hunley had uh, snorkels, but they were not like modern submarine snorkels. They had to be manually operated. So 
if you were cranking to go full speed ahead, you couldn't also be pumping <laughs> to get air into the Hunley. And they didn't right. really think about, um, uh, they didn't really know about, you know, the mixes of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So one of the ways that some of the early selection work was done on who should be the crew of the Hunley was to put people into uh, an enclosed tank, if you like, like the Hunley, which is a big metal tube, and see who fainted first and who fainted last, because that's your that's your tolerance of uh, um, more carbon dioxide in the air. And clearly, if you were going to be a submariner, the more you could tolerate higher levels of carbon dioxide, the more advantageous it was for you. Um, so that was one of the early examples of thinking about ergonomics in terms of environmental conditions and how those conditions affect performance. And, uh, forgive me. I, I uh, you know, there, these are all important physical principles. You, you also uh, shared with me, and I thought it might be interesting for our listeners and viewers about uh, the cognitive side of things and industrial psychology around World War II. So we started to think about uh, the mental aspects of work as well. Well, I'm going to turn the clock back just a little bit further to show you how it got to that. Yes. Um, back, in, back to the time of Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> wow. So one of the problems with having an army is you have to give them clothes. And one of the disadvantages is that if you have a portly gentleman and that gentleman gets shot or whatever and passes away in battle and you want to reuse the clothes, you can only get another portly gentleman. <laughs> and it, it, it becomes hard to think about how do you actually give people a suitable clothing. Of course, things like togas are universal clothes. So more ancient civilizations figured out Hey, you don't need to size things in the same way. But Napoleon wanted his people, his soldiers to look good. So he actually commissioned a Belgian statistician um, uh, called Ketelet to calculate uh, the body dimensions of soldiers. And Ketelet actually found that if you measure the height or the weight or the girth or whatever of soldiers, you get this bell-shaped curve. And that was the birth of what we call anthropometrics, which is a fundamental part of ergonomics today, which is if you're going to use a tool, it has to be the right size <laughs> for you or your body. Or if you're an astronaut going to space, you better have a space suit that can fit you. Otherwise, you're not going to space. Right. Um, right. So that goes back to, again, the uh, in the later 1800s. And then at the same time, working from that, was a British scientist called Sir Francis Galton, who set up a laboratory in London where people would pay to go and be tested. And he measured their body dimensions. And this led to the development of some ideas about physiognomy. That is, you know, the shape of your head determines whether you'll be a criminal, which of course is nonsense. But these were early ideas. So he began doing that, but he also began measuring reaction times. Um, Simple ways you would hold something like a ruler, let go and grab it again, and he could measure, you know, that gravity is 32 feet per second per second, you can measure the reaction time. And he also began measuring the cognitive abilities of people. And so his work persisted through to, uh, I guess, nearly 1920, maybe 1920 or so, and became, in a sense, the basis of what then developed into what we call intelligence testing and looking at the cognitive abilities of people. Now, the cognitive ergonomic side of that came out of the fact that just as um, Bessel had found and just as Golden found, people have different reaction times. Mm -hmm. So if you are looking at, let's say, a warning light, you know that somebody who has the fastest reaction time to being able to see that light is going to be able to do something quicker. So if you're a soldier and you can see that, you know, light is coming from the muzzle of a gun, you know that that light is traveling faster than the bullet could travel. And so now you can either take evasive action or return fire or do something else, right? That was now, of right. course, for much of the time when it was hand to hand combat, this didn't matter. But what happened in World Wars One and Two were the development of technologies that were very different. 
especially aircraft. So if you're now trying to shoot down an airplane, you can no longer aim a gun at the airplane because by the time the bullet reaches what you saw, it isn't there anymore. <laughs> right. So whole new systems had to be developed that gave you what we call anticipatory information. It's a little bit like you seeing something on your computer that says your hard drive is going to fail in the next 24 hours. <laughs> it yes. hasn't failed yet. But Or think of it, an everyday thing, driving a car, and now the warning light comes on that you have low fuel. It's not telling you you've run out of fuel, but it's giving you anticipatory information that says you're going to run out of fuel. Now you can take corrective action before you do that. The human body does this through a mechanism we call pain. Um, you know, you get this no pain, no gain, and we say no pain, not using your brain, because right. when something hurts, is the body saying, don't use it for a while. Yes. <laughs> Let it try and recover. Let's try and recover it or do some therapy. So um, the technology developments that happened in World Wars One and Two led to people rethinking what had up till then been sort of physical and to some degree environmental ergonomics into what became cognitive ergonomics. And that all came to a head on July the 12th in, uh, in a meeting of the British Admiralty. And um, July the 12th, uh, 1949, in which they were looking, they were going back over how weapon systems had failed. Uh, and they realized that more complex systems like a big gun on a ship require a number of people working in a team to be able to operate it correctly. Anybody make a mistake and the whole system collapses. And so they went, they, they had a meeting at the Admiralty. They invited a professor uh, of industrial psychology from uh, University of Wales uh, called Murrell, and he suggested some names for a new discipline. And one of the names that everybody agreed and liked was human ergonomics. Unfortunately, he hadn't met, read Jastrzebowski's papers uh, because they were in Polish. They weren't translated till much later. Um, right. So, so the, the Brits, in a sense, claimed ergonomics. And a few years later, in the early 1950s, the Ergonomic Society was formed and the first journal came out. Uh, here it is. You can't see it. But the Journal of Ergonomics, this is, you know, volume, volumes one to two, 1957. Right. Um, in the U.S., the, uh, a person called Alphonse Chapanis, a psychologist, was asked to look at why pilots flying B-17s often came back from long missions, night missions, and crashed the plane. They'd, they'd come into land, and then they'd retract the undercarriage, and the plane would belly flop on the runway. And he found out that it was because the controls for flaps, which you should put down, and controls for retracting landing gear were next to each other. They were the sh same shape. They operate in the same way. If you were tired and wearing flying gloves, you could easily confuse the two. And so he wrote a book um, called Human Factors Engineering, uh, in which he talked about the importance of thinking about human beings' cognitive and physical abilities in designing any technology. And then again, in the mid-50s, the Human Factor Society of America began. And subsequently, both societies have adopted each other's names. So in America, we have Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. In the UK, we have Ergonomics and Human Factors Society. The international body is just called the International Ergonomics Association. <laughs> There's enough words there. So cognitive ergonomics and physical ergonomics and environmental ergonomics all go together really well. And let me go back to that simple example of you, see, you seeing a warning light on the dashboard of your car saying you have low fuel. Um, if you happen to be in bright sunlight, that might not be bright enough for you to see. And it's quite possible then that you could run out of fuel if you're focusing on, on your driving. And so often there's an auditory signal that's also presented with the visual signal, just like the auditory signals reminding you to you know, put a seatbelt on. <clears throat> Those simple auditory signals are really important because your reaction time to a noise is about 50 milliseconds faster than your reaction time to light. 
So we start a race by firing a gun, not waving a flag. Uh, And that is also important then when people are doing work and designing industrial machinery or performing tasks. You you see if you are driving a forklift and you go into reverse, it starts beeping. The beeping is based on work done on uh, what is the fusion frequency. In other words, if you repeat a signal frequently enough, the brain can fuse it together. For vision, it's called critical flicker fusion, right? A flashing light, like the, the flashes on your car, the turn signals, you flash them too quickly and people will say, I, I didn't see them flashing. You flash them too slowly and they say, I didn't see them flashing. So there are critical ranges. The same is true for auditory ones as well. So, the, so ergonomics became not just this physical discipline, but also this environmental and cognitive discipline. And then the fact that people work in teams also means that it's an organizational discipline as well, because you can have the same four skilled people. And if those people hate each other, they will not work as effectively as if they really like each other. You know, so there are multiple factors to think about. And when you get some of these wrong, invariably people make mistakes at work, and those mistakes can lead to injuries, and that's what we're all trying to prevent. Well, that that's why I wanted to start here, and I appreciate that because as you're describing this, it's it's evocative. It it helps people realize that ergonomics is life. It it's not only life, but it's also history. You can track human history by these examples that you're citing here. And that's what I find very human, uh, pardon, I guess it's a pun, uh, it's not meant to be a pun, of the uh, the subject matter in, in, in general, that it, it really is a, a uh, tallying, or for lack of a better term, of human existence and human life, which brings me a little closer to the present now. What, sure. you know, what? caused a young Alan Hedge to find this uh, fascinating subject matter to <laughs> study. Uh, what, you know, again, I'm, I'm not joking. I'm no. really interested. Uh, you know, how, what caught your interest and caught your imagination and said, I, I want to dedicate my life to this kind of field? Um, when I was young at school, 16 years old, I had my first classes in biology. Uh, and I'd always been um, a, a very interested in things like physics and chemistry and math, so forth. But biology really grabbed me. And I decided that animals were more interesting than plants. <laughs> and so I went to university to read zoology. Um, and then I met my um, uh, current wife, who's my only wife, and 50 years we've been married this year, but we met 55 years ago, and she was reading psychology. Uh, And I attended a few of the psychology classes, and I said, this is just human zoology. (laughs) Yes. And so I became very interested interested in in behavior, but of course, it's hard to stick things in humans. (laughs) Uh, Now, much of what we knew about how nervous systems worked early on was from work done on cephalopods, um, on octopus, um, on squid, on cuttlefish, uh, on a a less interesting animal called a plesia, the sea hare. But the reason for that is that in invertebrate animals, for a nerve signal to move quickly over a distance, you need to increase the diameter of the nerve fiber. There's no insulation on the fiber. In mammals, we get over well invertebrates mammals on we get over that because we have a fat insulation called myelin so that the signal can leap along the nodes of rondier as and travel much faster so much of what we learned about nervous systems early on was done dealing with these much larger neurons where you could record the electric activity of of what was happening um and so I had decided that that's what I was going to work on. I'd read the work of a couple of researchers called Hubel and Wiesel, who'd worked out how animals see things. In other words, in the visual cortex, how does the signal from the eye get translated into being able to see a curve, a straight line, a diagonal line, and how do they get built up into more complex shapes? 
Uh, and I had decided to work on Octopus, which for, uh, also meant having to work in Italy. Uh, the Stazione Zoologica di Napoli, which is the oldest research station, marine research station in the world. Um, and, I, and octopus are very, very good at camouflaging themselves, at, at changing color. And I was going to figure out how all of that was done. Um, and so that was going to be my career. And then I, I did a whole set of experiments that I'd sort of uniquely designed that in the first year proved that they're colorblind. <laughs> now it's pretty hard to think okay you've now disproved what you were going to look at in your phd so i then looked at the time in the uk there was one graduate program in the whole of the uk that gave one scholarship a year for somebody to move from a related discipline into what was called applied psychology or we'd call it ergonomics these days Right. And so I did. I moved. I, I was fortunate in getting that, and I moved. And in that, um, I read this book, which you can't translate. It's called The Fundamentals of Real well, Skill, but actually has become Real Skill by Alan Welford. And it's a wonderful book that traces the whole history of, of our research into skilled behavior and why being skilled is a way of not just improving your performance, but reducing your risks of injuries and things. And so that was the start of it. And from then I went on and I did um, a PhD in that area and taught in the, at a university in the UK and, and then got asked to go and teach at Cornell, which I then did for a, a long time, since 1987. So that's what got me into that. But along, alongside that, all of this fortunately happened at a time of technology change. And that technology change was moving from typewriters to computers. Mm -hmm. And that meant a couple of things. I mean, if you think, uh, all of our modern computer standards are based on the right work that was actually done back in the early 1970s. In fact, uh, a former so a friend of mine um, who's long retired, um, Ahmet Chakir, wrote the first standard in Germany in 1976, and we still have it today. You have a separate desktop system. You have a separate screen. You have a separate keyboard. Back then, there were, wasn't a computer mouse commercially available, although it had been invented, it wasn't a commercial product. And so we still use that today because he realized that, you know, you have to think in terms of the size of the body and the reach distances and the viewing distances, that there's no way that you can have a laptop that is at a comfortable distance for you to reach, to type, where the screen is at a good distance. Now, of course, there weren't laptops in the 1970s, but many of the computers there were based on cash machines company called NCR made cash yes. registers and they got turned into things. So things like the Commodore PET was a glorified cash machine. <clears throat> IBM had keyboards built into its monitor screens, you know, so it was a glorified electric typewriter. But of course, those kinds of designs really don't work very well from a human standpoint. And so it's not surprising that, I mean, in the beginning, in the 70s, using computers was specialized. Yes. But when personal computers were launched in the early 80s, suddenly now you had a mass of people who weren't trained typists using computers. And then by the end of the 80s, we began to see a whole range of injuries that became yes. the cumulative trauma injuries of the 90s. And that was really the start of modern computer ergonomics, trying to look at how do we stop people from um, injuring themselves in in a, in such a bad way, working with computers. And the other thing that also changed was another technology development that got better, and that was in um, the ability to do warehousing and racking goods and using forklifts. And that meant suddenly, actually, you saw people doing more lifting activities as they were doing what's called order picking. And that led to an increase in back injuries because at the time, nobody really knew how, what's a safe way to be lifting. Um, yes. And the idea was, hey, the more you lifted, the stronger you got, and that's great till, till your back fails. Well, so we, that's, that's a part of history of how yes. we got to where we are now. And again, that, uh, the history that you brought, uh, brought the, the field profession along uh, at one point in the, uh, well, I want to say the early 90s, uh, you brought the RULA method uh, 
from the UK, I believe, to the US. Uh, tell us a little bit about the inspiration for that and and uh, uh, how how that all came about. Uh, so um, in the late 1980s, uh, Britain, Great Britain, had joined the European Union. Mm -hmm. And in 1989, the European Union or the European Commission uh, produced a document that said we should try and look after workers. We should do a risk assessment of work to try and design out the chance of injuries or accidents from the work system. Okay. And that was great, except we all kind of scratched our heads and said, well, where are the risk assessment tools? Now, back then, there were a couple of tools around that could measure things like comfort. So how comfortable is your chair, you know, and how much do you like it? There were some tools around that could measure um, your injury risks, but over long periods of time, like in the last year, how often have things happened? There weren't really any good, simple, fast, easy to use tools available. Um, when I moved to Cornell, I gave up tenure in the UK to go to an untenured job. And they said, after five years, we'll do your tenure review. And if you get tenure, then you'll have a year's sabbatic. And I, I was fortunate and I got tenure, which meant I had a year's sabbatic. So we actually moved back to the UK for a year. And I went and taught some courses at Nottingham University. Nottingham University had the chairperson, a man called Nigel Gawlett, who had a PhD student who was a former nurse called Lynn McAtamney from Australia. Um, and Nigel and Lynn began setting about this issue of how do you develop a risk assessment tool? Mm -hmm. And what came out of that was RULER, the Rapid Upper Limb Assessment Tool. And I thought, and so I knew of this because I was at Nottingham and I talked about this with them. And I thought this was really an interesting tool. So when I got back to the US in 1993, summer of 93, I organized a conference at Cornell University and I got Nigel to come and talk about RULER. And that brought RULER to the US. And we then began using it in all of our studies. For example, if you think that somebody is sitting and they're sitting in a poor posture, and they're at risk of a back injury or an arm injury or a hand injury or a neck injury, you could use ruler to quickly gauge that risk. And then you could either train them to sit in a different way, or you could give them a different chair, <clears throat> or you could reorganize the technology they were using in a different way, and you could assess afterwards, and then you could see, have I reduced the risk? And so suddenly it became a very, very useful evaluation tool. And that was the start of it. Um, Lynn and Nigel had validated that tool on two groups of operators in the UK. One was sewing machine operators, right, um, because they're sitting all day. And in fact, at the time, um, the garment industry was, was a very strong industry in the UK. <clears throat> and the second group were computer workers, data entry <laughs> workers, who were sitting all day using keyboards. So different technologies, a sewing machine, the keyboard's different, but essentially the postures and the movements are very comparable. So that's what they sort of uh, developed that based on. And we began using it and publishing articles about it and trying to promote it as a, what it is, it's a rapid screening tool to identify risk. It doesn't tell you what injury you'll develop. It doesn't tell you when you'll get injured. It doesn't tell you how badly you'll get injured. And it doesn't tell you how to not get injured. That's where the ergonomist comes in, right? And right. so it's a valuable tool for ergonomists to be able to use. And it's now 30 years old. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I, in fact, I, I talked to Lynn just a couple of weeks ago. Um, she's just gone off on seven weeks world travel. Uh, and we're going to write a 30 year follow up on. <laughs> what's happened with ruler um yes. and then of course subsequently a, a related method has been developed as well called reba that we can talk about if yes. that's of interest but that's why this was a, a the idea was to have a risk assessment tool that you could use in uh we arbitrary target of three minutes or less to be able to quickly scan 
is this person likely to get injured unless they change how they're doing work, what they're working with, what they're sitting on, what they're using? Precisely. A, a relative risk tool. And uh, as you have said uh, to me uh, off camera, you know, a, a snapshot. And you don't, I, I think you said it so eloquently, you can't shoot, you can't uh, decipher the plot of a movie from looking at one frame. It just gives you that one frame. And it's a good, it's good, a good place to start, but perhaps some infer too much from just that snapshot. Is that a safe uh, way of describing it? Well, um, yes, because it can work in both directions. Yes. That is, if you want to establish that this risky job really is safe, you can wait till somebody's sitting in the best posture and then do your eval evaluation. Right. Or you can say, oh, no, I'm going to make sure that, you know, <laughs> there's risk in this job. I want follow-up work, whatever. I mean, you can look for the worst thing. So we would always, I would always <clears throat> have um, students do multiple evaluations, yes. evaluate posture at the start of a task, maybe in the middle of that job, maybe at the end of the day. Um, you know, yes, you'll uh, remember you're only looking at the body sideways on. So you really need to look at both sides, that, which means you have to look at least twice. Um, right. So, yeah, there's a lot of subjective judgment goes into it. But ultimately, you know, people would all, always ask me, well, how accurate is it? What happens if you overestimate the risk? And if you overestimate the risk, it's good news because yeah. you're going to lower the risk. Everything yeah. you do is about lowering the perceived risk of the job. And we believe that if you lower that risk, you will lower the likelihood of an injury, and that will be better for the employee and be better for the work they do. That's great. And, and that's what we want to dive deeper into. I hope we can enjoy perhaps a series together. I, uh, uh, there's so much to look forward to that I, I really would love for our viewers and listeners to pick your brain a little bit. And I'll just name a few things. I mean, we're on the dawn of uh, artificial general intelligence. We have robotics now, virtual reality, haptic feedback, sensory substitution, sensory uh, enhancement, additive manufacturing. So there's a lot to look forward to. And that's why in this opening session together, I wanted people to get a sense of the history of, of we're talking about something that's actually 200 years old. And there's a lot still that we're going to be learning as we go along. Is, is that a safe uh, assumption? I think it's a very safe assumption. And uh, we can not only look at those technologies, but we can also look at other opportunities as well in the future. You know, I mean, for example, we're talking about uh, sending uh, missions back to the moon. Um, an extraordinarily complex undertaking that has to rely really heavily on really good ergonomics. And even then you're thinking about maybe going to Mars or going to other extreme environments. I mean, we have many, many challenges. We have an aging population. Um, we have, uh, there are still enormous limitations in what these auxiliary technologies can do to aid the human body. Um, right. Fundamentally, we still need to focus on how do we optimize everything for the human to use? Um, because even with the best will in the world at the moment, none of our technologies are foolproof. Precisely. That's going to be the uh, the nut to crack, so to speak. <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, Dr. Hedge, Alan, I, I hope we can have you back on a regular series to share your insight and foresight, if I might say, into the future and what we might be looking at in the world of ergonomics. And really, as I think, I hope we've made a case for here, life in general, because I don't know how we separate the two, to be honest with you. And I'm so glad you touched on uh, it's really its philosophical origins. And it's underpinnings in everything we do. Can uh, we enjoy maybe a, a follow-up with this uh, discussion? Uh, absolutely delighted to do that. I mean, you can probably sense that I'm pretty passionate about this area, having uh, spent a lifetime working in it. And so I think it's really important that people get to understand 
why things were developed, how they were developed, how to use them, how to interpret them, how to change something about how people are working to improve their quality of life and also improve the quality of the work that's being done. So absolutely delighted to talk to you again, Matt. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And we will look forward to that next uh, interview and discussion. Uh, Dr. Allen Hedge, thank you so much. And uh, that for the Tamiki Ergonomics Podcast, this is Matt Jeffs. We'll see everybody next time. Bye-bye. We hope you've enjoyed our interview with Dr. Alan Hedge. We hope to have him back on a regular basis to help broaden our understanding of ergonomics and the working world in general. Until next time, I'm your host, Matt Jeffs, for the Tamiki Ergonomics Podcast, saying bye-bye, everybody. Take care.